coming up next on Another View, what two Hampton Roads entities are doing to level the playing field when it comes to small business and the procurement process. Both Hampton and Portsmouth have taken a closer look at the makeup of the companies selected to do business with the city or school system. They have both conducted disparity studies and representatives are here with us today to share the results. Why should it matter who a city or school division does business with? And how can small women and minority owned firms benefit from the results of these studies? I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We'll talk about diversity within the procurement process right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It is the holiest of weeks in the Christian and the uh, Jewish faith this week. And just want to say happy, uh, easy, happy Good Friday to those of you who are of the Christian persuasion and happy Passover to those of you of the Jewish persuasion. And we are glad that you are with us today. Also want to give a special shout out to the Women of Distinction of 2013. We had our luncheon yesterday. This is um, an award that is presented by the YWCA of South Hampton Roads, of which I proudly serve as the board chair. And we honored 13 women who are making a difference here in Hampton Roads. And so congratulations again to our 2013 Women of Distinction. So today we're talking about equality and opportunity for women-owned and minority businesses when it comes to doing business with municipalities and school systems. Now, two cities in Hampton Roads have conducted procurement disparity studies. In Portsmouth, it's the school system. In Hampton is the city and the school system. And apparently they didn't like the results because both have made changes to level the playing field. Joining us to talk about equality and doing business in the public sector is Dr. Mark Whitaker, chair of the Minority Contracting Committee, Portsmouth Public School Board. Welcome, Dr. Whitaker. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Mr. Bruce Williams, vice president of economic justice with 200 plus men. Hi, Bruce. Hi, how are you? Robert? Okay, great to have you. And joining us by phone is Ms. Jessica Spencer, minority business coordinator with the city of Hampton's Department of Economic Development. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hello. We're glad to have you join us on the show today. So, Bruce, I'm going to start with you because I want to make sure that our audience really understands what we're talking about. So what is a disparity study and why is it necessary to do one? A disparity study is a study of the procurement practices of a municipality it's done by a third party. It's demanded based on the Supreme Court case of Croson versus Richmond. Uh, during, what happened in that case? In, in, during the age, of, we had a period of time we had affirmative action. We had activities that cities were trying to e e e e e make the level playing field for procurement. Mm -hmm. While well, the reverse discrimination issues came up, and in the court case, it was said it was stated that the Supreme Court stated that you have to prove a disparity exists either on racial or gender basis to do remedies that will stand up in court, stand up against a court challenge. So that became the standard. Okay. And that's why This happened in the eighties? This happened uh, back in nineteen eighty nine, okay. as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. It was Croson versus Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Because Richmond, Virginia had a program in place. They were doing things to try to increase the number of minority women-owned firms, minority firms, particularly black firms, to get more contracts. Mm -hmm. Croson sued the city, went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court came down with a ruling saying, if you could prove it with a dis third-party disparity study that's properly done, that could stand up in court, mm -hmm. then you can do those kinds of race or gender-based remedies to the disparity that you find. And the study takes into account the capacity of... Uh, how much is being done? It studies the procurement history in terms of contracts, bidders. It takes into account um, interviews, so you get the both the empirical kinds of study. Mm -hmm. It does surveys. It does analysis, regression analysis, and it's really detailed. And after you've done it, then you get a percentage of what whether you're underutilizing or overutilizing a particular race-based 
company, women-owned company. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. And it's pretty expensive. It Well, relatively speaking, it has a cost to it. But if you want to say, what is the cost of fairness? Okay. I mean, that becomes an issue. I think there was a $130,000 uh, parking study that was done. It depends on the size of the municipality. Mm-hmm. It depends on how many municipalities or entities are doing it. And when 200 plus men back in 2011 made the decision to have all of the entities that spend public money do it, our goal was maybe if they did the group that way as a group, it would save money. But in either case, you can't write policy that will stand up in court unless you've done the study. Okay. So, Dr. Whitaker, what was going on in Portsmouth Public Schools that made you all say, hey, wait a minute, we need to take a look at this and do this study. Right. Back in uh, 2002, when I was elected to the Portsmouth Public School System, uh, one of the first issues that I raised uh, was the fact that um, there was an indication that we were not contracting uh, with uh, African-American firms. Uh, Being that our city is over 50 percent African-American, our school system 70 percent uh, African American, the tax base um, there that supports our public schools, uh, majority African American. Um, I raised the issue, and it was interesting. I was just reading back in uh, December 19th of 2003, the pilot uh, wrote a story on our school board meeting in which uh, that issue was raised, um, and the uh, black board members were blocked by the white board members from. Um, doing a disparity study uh, because of what uh, Bruce mentioned. One of the issues was the cost, and uh, but there was just a major uh, backlash against trying to level the playing field. Mm-hmm. And so did businesses come to you? Did they say, you know what, we're trying to, to get on board and we can't? Um, you know, give, well, give us a little sense of well, how that came to be. Well, first. Fir- first of all, as a student of history, I realize that um, economic oppression is not a new issue, uh, particularly in the Old Dominion as well as the United States. And so the history of discrimination um, in Virginia and contracting, uh, the federal laws that require us um, to um, have equal opportunity. And so um, with that in mind, I believe coming on board as an African-American uh, board member that we have to be conscious of our history and issues that have been uh, perpetuated um, through um, past discrimination. And so that awareness, that personal awareness, as well as the um, fact that uh, I know that organizations um, were uh, making issues about not contracting. And so both from a personal perspective and from the organizational perspective, I realized there was an issue in Portsmouth. So you said in the beginning that you were brought up the issue of we should do this study. It, you were voted down. Right. Where? How did you move it forward? Well, I just continued to uh, stand on the wall. Um, Cheryl, I believe her name is Cheryl Cashin. She is a associate law professor at Georgetown University. Uh, She has written about the tyranny of the majority. And what we were facing was the fact that we had, uh, and it was literally voting along racial lines on that issue. There are nine board members. Six of them uh, were white, three were black. Mm -hmm. And they just voted uh, straight along racial lines that they were not going to to do this. And I just continued um, to press the issue and keep it in And that front. was in 2003? That was in 2003. Okay. So at what year did you guys actually do the study? We finally just got it. Uh, we got it approved in what, 2011, and it was finalized in 2012. So it was literally... Uh, so it took uh, almost 10 years. Right. Well, at that time, I was the youngest board member ever elected to the <laughs> city for the school board. So some of them I outlived, and some of my, my energy just outlasted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I want to talk about the results in just a minute. But Jessica, I want to ask you in terms of the city of Hampton, the same question I asked Dr. Whitaker. What was going on in Hampton at the time to make you all say, hey, wait a minute, we need to do a study and figure out what's going on? Well, actually, uh, Hampton conducted the first study was uh, completed in January of '06. Uh, mm-hmm. The city of Hampton uh, conducted their study following the first Commonwealth of Virginia study that was done. And at that time, um, as mentioned, the Croson versus 
case that was in Richmond concluded in 89, Mm -hmm. and localities and government agencies were looking at where are our procurement dollars going. Uh, So when the state initiated their study, City of Hampton, following that, initiated our first study Mm -hmm. uh, to look at our procurement activities for both city and schools. Uh, And from that study, it indicated that minorities and women were underutilized, and many recommendations were provided. From that point on, we developed a plan. Uh, It was approved by city council, Mm -hmm. and we implemented changes to remedy the situation. Okay, uh, so, so let's talk about some of the recommendations. What have you done to to make to level the playing field? Okay, uh, from the first study, oh six, uh, we implemented uh, uh, core components. We wanted to increase opportunities for businesses, increase the awareness. Uh, mm-hmm. We also revised bidding procedures and guidelines. We've implemented a training and financial assistance program, as well as we implemented monitoring processes to monitor uh, what is occurring in the city and how dollars are being spent for both uh, the city and schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, um, we raised the performance bond threshold, which enables uh, more more minority and women-owned businesses to bid on contracts here within the city of Hampton. Mm -hmm. Um, We revised the uh, guidelines to include requiring quotes from a minority women-owned business, documenting those efforts, uh, as well as looking at the management of the program, making sure department heads and other staff members are accountable to ensuring that everyone is following the revised procurement guidelines and so Mm -hmm. forth. And, you know, I'm going to ask you about that accountability piece, because what is the teeth? And I'll come to you in just a second, Dr. Whitaker. Um, but what what are you using in Hampton to back it up, if you will? What's what's the teeth behind it? OK. Um, in the uh, our procurement dollars, we monitor everything from credit card purchases, mm-hmm. small purchases, which are made within the various departments that fall under nine $9,999. We then have contracts through our procurement office under $100,000, contracts above $100,000, and our subcontracting work. Okay. Um, uh, the policies were revised. Small purchases, credit card utilization all fall within the departments. Each department head, it is included in their performance evaluation that they're documenting their efforts and monitoring to make sure that those quotes are uh, gotten by their staff members and everything is followed according to process. For the contracts over Mm $100,000, we're establishing, uh, right now we have aspirational minority and women-owned business goals on those contracts. Uh, When bids are submitted to the city, uh, forms, contract language has been revised. It requests that bidders submit to us. Uh, efforts that they've made to utilize minority women-owned businesses as subcontractors. So they have to document. Correct. Mm-hmm. And once the pro- the contract is awarded, uh, this office, we monitor the activity of those subcontractors, the payments made to those firms, and also uh, any uh, changing or any issues related to the subcontractors that they initially listed on the paperwork when they submitted the bid to the city. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, also in the program, although we're monitoring, we provide a, we provide city council with annual updates on the program activities. I work very closely with a group called the Purchasing and Procurement Oversight Committee, which is a committee uh, whose members are appointed by city council. They include one of the council members and a member of the uh, Hampton School Board and other uh, folks on the council, some of which are business owners. And we meet monthly. We review quarterly reports, Mm -hmm. looking at everything from the credit card purchases to the larger contracts to the subcontracting dollars. And in the process of implementing the changes, we've had to develop reports to monitor better. We provide uh, required training annually on procurement uh, guidelines and processes to all staff in the city. Uh, We now have a small business directory, 
in which staff and school members are to utilize when they are looking to solicit quotes from uh, minority and women-owned vendors. Uh, we also uh, have a newsletter to let the public know where we are, what we're doing, and what uh, opportunities and incentives are offered to them. Okay. And what kind of progress have you made? We have made very good progress. If you were to look at the uh, initial study in 06, it indicated that I think it was 3.2% of our uh, procurement dollars were going to minority and women-owned businesses. Okay. okay. Um, and wh- how large was that pool? So of, of that three, that three point two percent rep- of of how much money? Do you know? Okay, not in front of me. I don't okay. have it. But initially, that was the results of the study, which was not very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we implemented the plan, came into implementation across the board, fiscal year ten, fiscal year eleven, fiscal year twelve, and now we're in fiscal year thirteen. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And do you know what the numbers are now? Uh, How they've well, grown? fiscal year, initially we went from 3.1% was in fiscal year 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, we then last year we had 9.87% uh, awarded or procurement dollars spent with minority and women-owned vendors. So actually more than tripled wow. the utilization from when the first study so efforts, if you put them in place and you monitor them, uh, you can uh, increase your utilization, and we're still working toward that. And as I mentioned, uh, after the first study, uh, we really had to start from ground zero with the directory, enhancing our website. We've done uh, a great deal of training and partnering with the uh, uh, regional cities, some state agencies to provide business development support to mm-hmm. our vendors. We have an MOU with Department Minority Business Enterprise. They have a staff member on site here in the office three days a week to work with firms to provide technical assistance as well as certification. Mm-hmm. Uh, so efforts, we're making those efforts, and they are resulting in increased utilization as well as uh, assisting firms with their business growth, mm-hmm. keeping them engaged with the city. Jessica, is there an overall goal for the for the city of Hampton? Um, we do not have an overall goal based upon the first study. We, our goals were established by business categories. Okay. Uh, the five business categories being your construction, architecture, and engineering, professional services, goods and supplies, and other uh, services. Mm-hmm. And, but within those categories, I mean, are you trying to get to ten percent? Are you trying to get to twenty percent? Or or have you not set a threshold? Uh, the threshold is based upon the business category, say our construction project. Uh-huh. We have a minority business enterprise goal of 4.34. The WBE goal would be 3.82. The goals are separate mm-hmm. for a reason to ensure that both um, our groups, uh, you look to uh, utilize both groups. But the goals that are set on our larger contracts are based upon the business category from the first study. I see. Okay. And now you're all about to embark on another study, aren't you? Yes, we've just started on our second study. Um, it was, the contract was awarded, uh, uh, com- the award was completed December 2012, and now we've started on our second study um, uh, reviewing the procurement activities that have occurred from the last study mm-hmm. up to uh, and through um, 2012. So we're hoping to get additional recommendations and other processes that we can use to even uh, assist us even greater with increasing our utilization and developing our firms in the area. Okay. Dr. Whitaker, let me talk to you about Portsmouth study. What was the, what were the results and what have you all put in place? Right. Well, first of all, um, just to do a disparity study, that's, that's just the initial step. Um, the Commonwealth of Virginia has done a disparity study, mm-hmm. but nothing has been done in essence to uh, increase um, the utilization of minority contractors to a point um, that there's no longer any discrimination taking place. So I, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that just doing a disparity study isn't enough. Mm-hmm. There has to be accountability and enforceability in the implementation of the disparity study. 
I believe what sets Portsmouth um, program apart as far as our minority women business program is that the accountability part of it, um, we have language now that will be implemented in contracts for our employees. We were just discussing this yesterday Mm -hmm. um, at one of our subcommittee meetings. Uh, That language will hold personnel accountable through uh, an evaluation instrument uh, that will be used so that now we can't uh, pass the baton around the organization as far as who's responsible for making sure. So part of their evaluation of how they do their job will be included. This will be included. Right. How we Mm -hmm. move through this um, level in the playing field, um, it, it will not just be uh, an issue that cannot be measured, but it will be measured in evaluations. Mm -hmm. Also, another accountability part is on the side of the contractors. That is, within our program, which I think is uh, unique, which I hope other jurisdictions will um, add, is that contractors uh, will be held accountable as far as one of the things that happens in this industry that we found out is that Uh, Majority contractors will submit bids that will include minority contractors in their initial bid. When they win the contract, they don't use the minority contractors. One of the things that we're doing to make sure accountability is there is that penalties will be in place. Um, Their ability to bid again in Portsmouth uh, with Portsmouth Public Schools uh, would be jeopardized. Um, and, and also we have uh, significant documentation um, to correlate who they say they're going to use with uh, who they actually uh, pay. And so that was one of the things that um, we wanted as a board, that we wanted a program that was not just window dressing, but it was actually putting Adding the teeth, teeth again. in place so mm-hmm. that now, and, and, and just because we see an increase in utilization, um, a disparity study will show whether uh, you are underutilizing. So just because we're increasing utilization does not mean that we're no longer underutilizing. And so we want to make sure, that was one of our discussions yesterday too, we want to make sure that as we proceed, that when we're giving contracts, we want to make sure we're moving in a direction that we are utilizing. That is not violating the 80% Uh, rule when it comes to measuring whether discrimination is present or not. And Mm -hmm. so we're looking to put in those type of uh, processes so that there's some substance uh, to our program and it's not just uh, something that we do to give an appearance that we're trying to correct uh, the problem, but we're putting in place concrete measures to make sure we're moving in that direction. Okay, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation today. Um, If you are a minority or woman-owned business and you have um, become a part of the procurement process for any of the municipalities, give us a call. Let us know what your experience has been. 440 Two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Joining us on the phone now is the mayor of the city of Portsmouth, uh, Mayor Kenny Wright. Hi, Mayor. How are you? Well, hello, Barbara. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you so much for calling in. We appreciate this. We're talking with Dr. Whitaker about what they're doing with the school system. What about the city of Portsmouth? Are you interested in doing a disparity study? Um, along the procurement lines for the city. Absolutely. Actually, we have just put out an RFQ this week uh, to actually have the study done. I'm sitting here listening to you as I'm riding down the highway in my Mm -hmm. vehicle, and I want to call in and make sure that I let you know how much I applaud the efforts of your guests. Dr. Whitaker, uh, especially, he has been dogmatic in this area. When I got elected two years ago, it was very disturbing that we had allowed our school system to go forward with this without having the whole city. And so we just passed on council a resolution two weeks ago to allocate funding uh, to have the study. And the actual RFQ was just put out this week. So we're excited about it. Um, we want to be a team player. But as Mr. Williams talked about, this really needs to be a regional effort. And we need 
all of the cities and all of the mayors to get behind this because it is about fairness and equality. And so I just wanted to call in and, and, and make that announcement that the city of Portsmouth is going to soon be joining our school board as well as the city of Hampton and trying to make sure that we do what's right for all of our citizens in the region. Well, I have to tell you, Bruce is sitting here giving the high five sign. <laughs> He's very excited about that. But let me ask you, Mayor, um, because I remember reading an article uh, in the pilot a little while ago. There are some people, and I open this up to all of my guests, who say, well, okay, this is all fine and good, but you're not being fair to the other businesses if you do this. How do you respond to that? Oh, absolutely uh, incorrect. This is all about fairness. When you live in a city or in a region, Hampton Roads region is 1.7 million people. We have approximately 535,000 African Americans in this Hampton Roads region. And for, as Dr. Whitaker mentioned earlier, for that big of the disparity, when you look at how much work we're actually letting out to minorities and women-owned businesses, it is extremely disturbing not even on the regional level, but on the state level. I think one of your guests mentioned that the state had done this study a while back, but unless you actually get behind it and put teeth in it, all you have is just a study. And so mm -hmm. with the efforts in Hampton, and actually I want to thank the city of Hampton, I actually met with them and talked about some of the issues that they did and some of the initiatives that they took. So we in the city of Portsmouth would, would benefit from that. So I appreciate uh, the Vice Mayor George Wallace and some of his folks' effort in and helping us get to where we are today. Okay. Mayor Wright, we appreciate you calling in. Thank you so much. And Absolutely. I know that we will be discussing the results of that study once it is done. We're proud. Absolutely. Of We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right, All righty. Bye-bye. Bruce, you you do have a resolution. 200 plus men has required or called for all of the municipalities in Hampton Roads to do this. In July of 2011, we issued a resolution for 200 plus men uh, to all of the cities in Hampton Roads. We are so proud of Portsmouth leading the way with Hampton to make this change because economic justice is, is a part of what we're about at 200 Plus. We recognize Martin Luther King died in an economic fight, not just, you know, he was beyond the civil rights. He recognized just being in the store doesn't help you if you don't get the money to spend anything. Mm -hmm. So we are very proud of the fact that Portsmouth is leading the way in this new initiative, and we're going to carry this to every single city in Hampton Roads. Uh, this uh, resolution we issued back in 2011 went to all of the city councils, but we need to put ourselves in front of these city councils, and we're asking any of the women-owned and minority-owned business owners or anyone interested in this issue to join us when we make our visits, and we begin our first visit with the city of Suffolk next Wednesday, at April the 3rd, uh, at uh, 7 o'clock, we'll be there to re request that the city of Suffolk do the same thing that the leadership in, in the city of Portsmouth have done. Mm -hmm. On April 9th, Newport News mm -hmm. at 7 o'clock. On April 16th, Chesapeake at 6.30. On uh, April the 23rd, Norfolk at 7 p.m. And on May 14th, Virginia Beach at 6 p.m. So you're meeting with the councils of Everyone each of these Everyone will be making our presentation. Mm -hmm. We will be... Uh, our membership will be there. We're asking all those who support this issue to be there. And we're going to uh, appeal to our legislators in this region that they follow the example of Hampton and Portsmouth mm -hmm. to begin the process of studying where we are and righting the wrongs. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. If you're a procurement officer, if you are involved in the procurement process for your municipality, we would love to hear from you about this issue. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. 9402240 and if you're just joining us we're talking about diversity in the procurement process with Dr. Mark Whitaker who is chair of the Minority Contracting Committee with Portsmouth Public School Board Bruce Williams Vice President of Economic Justice with 200 plus men and Jessica Spencer Minority Business Coordinator with the City of Hampton's Department of Economic Development Dr. Whitaker just want to mention, uh, you raised a very relevant issue in uh, talking with the mayor um, as, as far as the reverse discrimination issue. 
Um, that's one of two major uh, issues that um, I believe there's been some reservations um, by some of the jurisdictions that I believe we need to um, really uh, correct that and, and put that in the right light. Uh, that is, of course, anyone can be sued. What you want to make sure is that you set up a program um, that is legally correct. Um, the Croson case sets the standards uh, by which you can put your program in place uh, so that if those issues of reverse discrimination come up, you can make sure that your uh, program is legally correct. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the disparity study on the Croson. It requires that there be a statistically significant disparity. Uh, your disparity study um, measures uh, that. Also, it requires that it be narrowly tailored to address uh, those particular areas uh, where the discrimination is occurring. And uh, that's what you heard the uh, city of Hampton mention in the different uh, categories. Mm -hmm. And so if if your program is following those mandates, then legally um, and constitutionally you are protected. And I say that because I know that um, there has been some misadvice um, that has been given to local jurisdictions, particularly in Portsmouth. I know that the former city attorney uh, was very conservative um, in his advice and opinion, and it trickled down to our board. And mm -hmm. so um, we have to be cautious and aware of that. The other issue um, that is a myth is the fact about money and costing more to contract with minority businesses. Uh, we just had a report um, yeah, speak on that. What do you yeah. mean? Why does it cost there, more? There, well, it or why is there a perception it, 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 that well, it costs more? You know, anything <laughs> to keep from doing the right thing sometimes. And um, th there's a myth out here that by contracting with minority businesses that these primes will have to pay more and therefore you have uh, higher contracts. Well, we just got a report yesterday um, with one of our uh, construction projects where the uh, actual uh, aspirational goal in that project was something like 9%. The contract ended up using 22%. And if I remember correctly, there was a savings from the initial estimate of, of over $200,000. So let me make sure for, for the audience that they understand this. So you have this project. You're, when you say aspirational goal, we said we would like to have 9% of women and minority-owned businesses involved in this project. Right. Is that right? Right. And then you actually achieved 22%. Exactly. And saved money. Exactly. In, 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 in addition exactly. to. Exactly. Which dismisses two of the myths that are, that are out here that, number one, they're not here. Where can we get them? And we know that this region, we, we have significant presence mm -hmm. of qualified uh, businesses uh, that can do the and job. And I want to come back on that point, but I want to talk to Dorothy in Virginia Beach. Hi, Dorothy. You're on the air. Hi, Dor Hi Barbara. It Hi. was great to see you yesterday at the Y event. A <laughs> Thank you. Event. Thank I'm coming you. from a different side. I have been a woman business owner for the past 38 years. And to me... And he set aside is patronizing to me. I think that I am as capable and talented as any man. Of course, I'm sure men would disagree. But as, to me, when anyone has to set aside, I feel like they're trying to give me something. But I feel 100% that so many women business owners, I really don't know much about the minority business owners, but women business owners, are equal in every way to a man business owner. I appreciate your time. Okay, we will let the um, yeah. panel respond. Dr. Whitaker, you yeah. want to start? First of all, <clears throat> the, the language set aside, um, that's, that's unconstitutional. Uh, there, there's no set aside programs here. What we have is, is uh, the aspirational goal. Um, also, the, the fact that what we're doing is trying to open up the door so that uh, companies that have not been allowed to enter the door can at least come in. Um, and so it's, it's not a stigma or a disparagement on saying that uh, we have businesses out here, minority women, um, that are capable, competitive, can do the job, 
And we need to stop setting it aside just for majority businesses mm-hmm. that we need to open the door. And so um, uh, the the caller there, we, we don't have a set aside program. We have a competitive program where companies can bid. It's just that in that bid process, you have to show fairness. Okay. Jessica, you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, Hampton City and Schools, we do not have any set asides within our uh, minority and women-owned business program. Primarily, we looked to make sure that all small businesses have equal access, okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that the processes that we use are equitable to all parties, specifically small businesses. Uh, And with women-owned businesses, like minority-owned businesses, each business, uh, I think it goes back to a lot of people having stereotypes about what a woman-owned or minority-owned business can do. Our focus was just to make sure that the processes in place were equitable and open and fair to all small businesses to give them opportunities and so that they would engage with the city and bid on our contracts. And it is working. And most, if you talk to anyone that works in economic development, procurement, our small businesses uh, are the most innovative. They give you the... A lot of times, the best quality at a better price. Uh, we tend to look at disparity studies, and we always connect it to race and discrimination. Yes, that comes into play. But a disparity study is an economic tool. It gives any locality or state agency the legal uh, background to make changes uh, with contracting opportunities to uh, increase your business development by uh, implementing programs to assist small businesses. And when you do that, you increase your tax revenue and you add jobs to the market. So a study is one, it's an economic tool just to increase opportunities and business in your city, which adds to your tax revenue as well as creates jobs in the market. That benefits everyone. Okay, and Bruce, you wanted to respond? Well, I I interviewed hundreds of businesses throughout the state of Virginia, and when we started this thing, 38% of the businesses in Virginia are owned by women. And I agree with Dorothy that, yes, women can produce and do well in all of the things they do. The problem is they haven't had access. What's called the old boy situation comes out when I interview these businesses, women-owned businesses who have been in business, provide a quality service, provide quality goods, but haven't been able to get the opportunity to bid. That's what this is about. No guarantees, just an opportunity to play in a fair place. In a fair level playing field. Okay. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Warren joins us from Newport News. Hi, Warren. You're on the air. Uh, Yes. How are you? Okay. Okay. I got a couple comments I would like to make. Uh, First off, I employ uh, 30 individuals throughout the state of Virginia, and I've been contracting with the state over the past 10 years. Uh, One of my concerns, I hear the the comments in reference to the, the level playing field the uh, accessibility for opportunity and things of that nature. What I've seen in the trend is that the lowest bidder does not guarantee the state or the taxpayer um, services that they're actually paying for. The best way to uh, procure uh, contracts is through the uh, unsealed best value um, procedure because you have contractors that's out here that's low bidding the market and when it comes down to when you put the numbers and the, the pen to the pad, it shows that these people are actually putting in contracts that's less than minimum wage. So there's no way possible they can actually be putting tax dollars back into the community, upbuilding the community. And a lot of the procurement officers are going with the best, are going with the low bid because it's less work. There's no past performance. There's no history. There's no references. And that's a, uh, a challenge for a growing business like myself because with, uh, increase in taxes, increase with uh, medical care expenses, increase with overhead. You have to be able to not only have accessibility, but you have, a, you have to give the small minority and women-owned businesses a, a, a margin to be profitable. Okay. And let's let our the, let's let our guests respond to that because I've heard that also before. And Bruce, I'm going to turn to you for um, for a response to Warren. But the the whole idea of of the lowest bid mm-hmm. and whether or not minority businesses in particular can continue to function as a business mm-hmm. if they come in at the lowest. Well, this bid. gets us to the issues of common scale. Some of the Dr. Whitaker is pointing out too. I don't know if you recognize it or not, but a small business is defined 
as a business with 250 employees or $10 million in revenue. That's small business. Mm -hmm. Problem is, when you have a business of that size, they have economies of scale that allow them to bid low. And the lowest bid or lowest because price. Because they can also get the goods and services yeah. for a cheaper price. Uh, volume. Et cetera. Volume, volume. purchase. Mm -hmm. so, so in order for a program of best value to be put in place, that's why you have to, in a sense, have a disparity study to say that you're doing this because you have found that you have underutilization. What has happened, what, what uh, E.L. Ham found out, is when he got the study done for the state, they found they had small businesses on their list of small businesses. They were Fortune 500s. They found that their processes were all out of whack, and they were able to get the entire process in a much better frame. It's not where it should be. But what happens when you get an examination of the process, other things show up. It becomes a more fairer process, it, not just for racial and gender, but just in how you're doing business. And so in terms of best value, I was talking to one city official the other day. They've gone through seven companies cutting grass because they have to deal with the lowest bid. But when the guy gets the bid, he doesn't give them the quality. So in order to have those kinds of programs put into place, you really do need a disparity study because then a woman of minority firm who provides best value will give the taxpayers best bang for their buck. But don't you have to, Dr. Whitaker, have the rule in the, that you can accept best value? Well, the the issue that the caller was mentioning as far as the um, those contractors paying less, uh, that goes to your, your procurement officers also doing their due diligence because it requires the lowest responsive and responsible bid, considered, given the context in which the bid was made. Um, responsive, able to, they have responded correctly according to the mandates of the uh, request. Mm -hmm. um, the responsible, um, being able to uh, perform, that looks at a lot of issues that I think procurement officers need to take into account. And if if you have contractors who are bidding at a lower rate than what the law requires, then that's not a responsible bid. And so that's that's where those officers have to um, do their due diligence before, for example, for a contract like that would come before the school board, mm -hmm. um, they should have already reviewed that uh, with great detail as to um, the price structure that this uh, contractor has in place. And so those type of practices, um, those are things that we should hold those persons who are in charge of procurement and, and their departments, making sure they are screening uh, those bids correctly before they come to bodies, elected bodies, to uh, accept. To make the, the final de right. determination. Right. Jessica, I want to ask you, we've got about four minutes left in this discussion, and this is fascinating. We could go on for a while. But I want to ask you, um, because you talked about pulling together a, um, a directory of minority and women-owned businesses. What would you say to minority and women-owned businesses in terms of making themselves known so that they can take advantage of these opportunities what do you want um, them to know I want them to know that um, uh, get involved uh, engage themselves uh, you know we have a directory the State Department of Minority Business Enterprise has a directory there's most of these none of them have any cost for being included in these directories it's free marketing for your company we had a conference here Tuesday at Hampton University uh, uh, with uh, Department of Minority Business Enterprise, creating a cornerstone for change. Put yourself out there. Be a, don't be afraid to engage with other businesses. A lot of times you go to a conference, you can get work from just people you're meeting there at that conference. Uh, uh, you learn of different opportunities. There was a matchmaking event as part of that conference where procurement officers from the cities, the state agencies, right in one place okay. to meet with... Uh, Businesses. So one thing I would like for a small business to remember uh, to uh, use and get as much free marketing as possible, engage yourselves. You should know who the minority business person is with the cities uh, you're trying to get work with, where the procurement office is, uh, and uh, get and market your company as much as you can okay. and ask questions. 
Okay. And step out. And they can call you directly, <laughs> Jessica, can't they? Yes, they, they can. <laughs> okay. That is... keep going. My number is um, 757-728-5179. Okay. But they can call me directly. <laughs> Thank you. That's Ms. Jessica Spencer, who is a minority business coordinator with the City of Hampton's Department of Economic Development. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. We appreciate it. Okay, we got a minute and a half left, Ruth. Okay, what do you well, want them to know? For Portsmouth Public Schools, part of its new program is outreach. Okay. And if you want to get linked to their system, into their database, you can email us at Portsmouth Schools MWBE at Yahoo.com. Okay, we will put that on our website, but say it one more time. That's Portsmouth Schools MWBE at Yahoo.com. What you send us is your company, uh, how to reach you. We'll get you a, a form to do our uh, vendor profile. They've got it where they're doing things to do outreach. We have a uh, orientation, let's get your workshop on April 18th at Old Dominion. Okay. That's going to help on how you could get relationships. Some of the things that Jennifer, Jennifer was talking, Jessica was talking about. Mm -hmm. We're going to do some things on estimating, on bonding. This is a program where poor public schools trying to prepare people to be able to bid. Okay, so the help is out there. Dr. Mark Whitaker, who is the chair of the Minority Contracting Committee, Portsmouth Public School Board, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We really appreciate the information. And Bruce Williams, Vice President of Economic Justice with 200 Plus Men, thank you for joining us also. And I hope that small businesses have gotten something out of this and that you all will hear from them. From them. And we'll be right back. And welcome back. It seems everywhere we look, we hear interesting stories about people and places that have shaped history here in Hampton Roads. Today's story is no exception. It takes us to Franklin, Virginia, where a group of Hayden High School alums are working diligently to restore the school that transformed their lives. And as our Lisa Godley found out, in doing so, they also hope to preserve the memory of the school's amazing founder. Dr. Alvin Harris is one of more than 600 people whose life was transformed while walking the halls of Franklin's Hayden High School. What began as a boarding school for African-American girls in 1904 would eventually become Franklin's only high school for black youth and operate in that capacity from 1953 to 1970. It was a unique experience, very positive, the type of experience that students don't get anymore a very caring environment in which education and discipline were primary. It started as the dream of the school's founder, a courageous woman named Della Irvin Hayden. Her mother was a slave in Franklin, Virginia, and when the Emancipation of Proclamation occurred, her mother immediately jumped on a train, went over to Tarboro, North Carolina, picked up little Della and her grandmother, who the grandmother was a slave, but now they're all free. Jubilee has come and brought her and her grandmother to Franklin where she was reared. She had a magnet for a brain and just sucked up information from wherever she could get it. She studied at Hampton Institute, had a remarkable experience, graduated from there in the class with Booker T. Washington, and began her career as an educator. While attending Hampton, Della met a young man by the name of Hayden, who was also studying to be an educator. They married and taught school in a nearby county. Sadly, he died after just 11 months of marriage. But even in her grief, Della Hayden would not abandon her mission to increase the educational opportunities for African-American students. She was called to Petersburg to serve as the principal of the Virginia Normal and Industrial Institute, now Virginia State University. She was there for 13 years before returning to Southampton County. A local group which had organized to form an educational facility for the blacks of Southampton County in Franklin, Virginia, started a school. She went there, started teaching that school, and taught until 1924 when she met her untimely death the first automobile victim of the city. Harris is part of the Hayden Group, 
which is composed of local citizens working to keep Della Hayden's memory alive. They're doing so with a landmark project called the Hayden Village Center, which will turn the old Hayden School Building into a multi-use facility for education and recreation. The school is so fantastically built that it forms a excellent facility that can be renovated for community purposes. The Hayden Group has partnered with Senior Services of Southeastern Virginia to develop the center. John Skirvin is the chief executive officer. At this point, I'm pleased to report that the high school has been accepted for the Registry of Historic Places in Virginia, and we anticipate it will be accepted for the National Registry within, um, within a few months. At this point, we are actively pursuing financing, and we anticipate breaking ground um, sometime in July of this year or sooner. Importantly, the housing that will be there, the second floor ca- classrooms are going to be turned into uh, 10 apartments. Um, in addition to the housing and the youth activities in the museum, this project is going to create jobs. This will truly be a 21st century endeavor in which ideas will be able to be used as a foundational luncheon pad for many of the youth in the community with the respect and the legacy of Miss Della Hayden. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. Keeping history alive here in Hampton Roads. Time now for things to view and do in Hampton Roads. You will be my Saturday love. The Newport News Department of Human Services has a new program designed to help men be dads. It's called 24 7 Dad, a free interactive program to learn how to build and keep positive relationships with your child or children. The program is every Monday beginning April 8th until July 29th from 6 30 to 8 30 p.m. at the South Morrison Family Education Center, Adams Drive in Newport News. For more information, including registration, call 757-369-6813. Norfolk State University invites you to attend NSU Night at the Sandler, featuring performances by the nationally acclaimed NSU Concert Choir, Symphonic Wind Ensemble, Vocal Jazz Ensemble, Jazz Ensemble, and the NSU Dance Theater. It's Tuesday, April 9th at 7 at the Sandler Center in Virginia Beach. Tickets are available. Call 823-8323 to find out out more. A Restoration of Rights seminar will be held Tuesday, April 9th from 7 to 9 p.m. at New Hope Baptist Church, Old Great Neck Road in Virginia Beach. Find out about the new procedure that speeds up the decision-making process. Check with the church for details. The Hampton Roads Black Media Professionals will award scholarships to Hampton Roads area high school seniors who are enrolled in college for the 2014 school year. The Promise Scholarship is for African American students who want to go to college but are lacking funds. The deadline to apply is Monday, April 15th. Visit www.hrbmp.us and click on scholarship for the application. And the Virginia Beach Travel and Tourism Foundation is accepting scholarship applications for Virginia Beach College or University students majoring in culinary arts, hospitality, or tourism management. Visit www.vbttf.com and click on scholarships to find out the requirements and to apply. These and other events are on our website, anotherviewradio.org. You can also download today's show or any other Another View program. Sign up for our eView newsletter, which is a once a week reminder of upcoming shows, or just send us a note. Next week, African American poets Tim Siebels, Ramika Bingham, and spoken word artist Godchild. That should be a great show. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Daniel Jenkins, who answered our phone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fabulous weekend, and let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.